Hello Booktube. I have a Friday mail haul for you here. A, a bunch of books that we can look at on this uh, cold and overcast Friday. <laughs> it wasn't cold and overcast all day. The, uh, the morning, the mid-morning, the early afternoon were all bright and sunny. Not a cloud in the sky. Bright blue skies. Uh, and my little schnauzer, Frida, and I took advantage of that and spent a huge portion of that time outside. <laughs> Which is not usual. She is a very hardy little dog. Terriers are very hardy little dogs, but she knows what she likes and what she doesn't like. She's not particularly fond of cold weather. She hates the wind. And, I, of course, on this channel, her dislike of rain is legendary. <laughs> Ordinarily, on a day like this, even in bright sunlight, I would expect that she would get chilly after a little while and want to turn around. But uh, our, our long, sort of pointless rambles from one place to another tend to happen in the spring and summer, but not today. <laughs> so we've been, we've been out and about quite a bit. Uh, but I've got, I've got mail for you for, uh, to end a, a pretty good mail week for these, the, these decreased times. I've had a huge number of uh, review copies, but most of them have been electronic. Most of them have been ebooks. Uh, but we still got mail. And the first two pieces are al fresco. <laughs> they are, we're not going to open packages. There are two romances here I want to show you that are forthcoming uh, that are already opened. <laughs> One is not only forthcoming, it's already out. It will be in your bookstore as uh, a $10 paperback. This is Lori Foster. This is a Mackenzie's of Ridge Trail novel called No Holding Back. Uh, there he is. Uh, not the perfect place to sit and ponder, but nevertheless. Uh, and this is... Uh, smoldery type romance uh the the big line the tagline on the back of the cover is not needing him won't stop her from wanting him <laughs> trucker sterling star parson is no stranger to the challenges a woman faces both in her industry and in life but she can take care of herself she's never needed or wanted a man around until she meets cade mckenzie the take charge bar owner sets off all kinds of alarm bells for sterling but he also sets her heart racing. Cade's lived in Ridge Trail long enough to know trouble when he sees it, and the moment Sterling, Star, walks into his bar, he knows trouble's come to call. Secrets run deep in the small town, and Cade can tell Star's got as many as he does, leaving him itching to uncover every last one. <laughs> but finding common ground will mean trusting one another, further feeding an intense attraction that's growing impossible to resist. Uh... And I glanced, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, but I glanced uh, quickly at the opening pages and found a description of Cade. <laughs> uh, uh, he was contained, professional, but not in a way that suited a businessman. More like a guy who knew he could handle himself in any situation. A guy who easily kicked butt, took names, and did so without a scratch. Those thick shoulders, studying his body, left a funny warmth in Sterling's stomach sending her an interested gaze to his pronounced biceps, watching the fluid bunch and flex of them with the smallest movement. His pullover shirt fit his wide chest perfectly, showing sculpted pecs and letting her attention drift downward to a flat, firm middle. <laughs> Sounds like he's a science experiment, <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what you can get. That's what you're looking forward to in No Holding Back by Laurie Forster, which is out already. It had a, a late January release, so... Uh, so it came out in the third week of January. It's difficult to exactly date these things, w whether it came out a little bit before the President of the United States incited a violent mob to sack the Capitol and overturn American government, or whether or not it came out into bookstores a little bit after the President of the United States incited a violent mob to sack the Capitol and overturn the U.S. government. You know, it's always difficult to tell on which, uh, which side of a dividing line these things occur. Uh, and the next romance is very different. This will be, uh, I mean, Laurie Forster's No Holding Back. Uh, I think I've read other books by this author. I think I have a few of them on that bookcase behind me. Uh, and they're fairly sudsy. Uh, whereas I'm pretty sure this next one will not be. This is Susan Mallory, and this is The Vineyard at Painted Moon. Lovely thing. Lovely design. Of course, Susan Mallory is a well-known commodity romance readers of a certain type. Romance readers who love uh, romance novels that are the equivalent of a warm, slightly teary hug uh, will know to flock to this author. She will never disappoint. And this thing is slated for early February, so it's it's coming right up. Uh, I don't think I have a sheet for it at all. 
Oh uh, no, we'll just we'll just uh, uh, Mackenzie Deans seems to have it all. A beautiful home, close friends, and a successful career as an elite winemaker with her family winery. There's just one problem. It's not her family. It's her husband's. In fact, everything in her life is tied to him. His mother is the closest thing to a mom she's ever had. Their home is on the family compound. His sister is her best friend. So when she and her husband admit their marriage is over, her pain goes beyond heartbreak. She's on the brink of losing everything. Her job, her home, her friends, and worst of all, her family. Staying is an option. She can continue to work at the winery, be friends with her mother-in-law, hug her nieces and nephews, but as an employee, nothing more. Or she can surrender every piece of her heart in order to build a legacy of her own. If she can dare to let go of the life she thought she wanted, she might discover something even more beautiful waiting for her beneath a painted moon. I have to admit, I haven't dipped into this book at all, even to get to the bulging pecs and rippling flat stomachs, but... Uh, uh, I have to admit, a little bit of that uh, synopsis caught me off guard. I, I, if she's if if her mother-in-law is the closest thing she's ever had to a mother, one presumes the feeling is mutual. If her if her sister-in-law is her best friend, one presumes the feeling is mutual. If she's been a, an integral part of this vineyard, an elite winemaking, one presumes that she and her husband made that official. Gave her some sort of title, a salary, that sort of thing. It, in other words, I mean, I understand the uh, the upheaval that Susan Mallory is getting at here. If your whole world revolves around the world of your husband and you break up, that's going to cause... Uh, that's, that's fertile grounds for a, a terrific storyline. It's just the other part of it, that, that if you lose your husband, you're suddenly just a rank-and-file employee in a business that I presume, again, I'm presuming, that she helped to build it. Uh, so I'd be interested to see how that works out. Uh, I'm interested in both of these for slightly different reasons. <laughs> but then we have packages. Then we have packages that we can open. Uh, no boxes. Uh, so that's good, since I've, I'm now traumatically associating boxes with you people sending me presents. Those of you who are maybe tuning in late uh, to the little ongoing Steve Donahue melodrama, uh, rule number one on this channel is don't send me a book. <laughs> don't send me a book. And if you're absolutely determined to send me a book, then I leave my email on every video. Feel free to email me first and sound me out about it. None of this business about surprising an eight-year-old on Christmas morning. It doesn't have to be a surprise for me to wee squee with happiness. But you should at least check first, uh, because I almost certainly will either already have the book or not want it. And I feel a little bit dumb saying that, because the last few presents have been bullseyes. But nevertheless, <laughs> but but uh, if we don't have boxes, then maybe we don't have, maybe we don't have to worry about that. Ew, gross! I touched an invoice. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh, very good. Okay, all right. I already have this uh, in a couple of e-copies. I have an e-book of the UK release and an e-book of the American release, and here is the printed book of the American release. This comes out. Oh my! The date on it is June. Lordy. <laughs> That's a long time from now. But some of you will know this already if you've been watching uh, UK book prizes. This is by Paul Mendez, and it is Rainbow Milk. And that is the US cover, which is subtly different from the UK cover. I don't know, not exactly sure which one I prefer. This one has some issues <laughs> that the UK cover did not have. Uh, the UK cover was, I think, better designed. You have a face, you have a rainbow, <laughs> you have stuff like that. Whereas, what is this person doing? Uh, the, the, the photograph that was chosen here is disturbingly emblematic of uh, modern day 21st century gay fiction, where the loving and even quasi erotic self embrace is the whole ballgame. <laughs> Who else would you embrace? <laughs> Who's any better in the world or in the history of the world than you? <laughs> But uh, this was shortlisted for a few awards, and uh, I'm very much intrigued by it. What have we got here? Let's see. Just in case you're not uh, you're not familiar with it, this is a debut novel, I believe. Uh, an essential and revelatory coming of age narrative from a thrilling new voice. Yeah, this is a debut novel. Uh, Rainbow Milk follows 19 year old Jesse McCarthy as he grapples with his racial and sexual identities against the backdrop of his Jehovah's Witness upbringing. Jesse McCarthy. Don't I remember a, a 
four foot ten roasting tobacco addict pop star named Jesse McCarthy, uh, who manages to who managed to do a couple of genuinely catchy songs. If I remember correctly, he did a a song called Leaving that was very catchy. Uh, maybe I've got the wrong name on that, but anyway, uh, in the nineteen fifties. Ex-boxer Norman Alonzo is a determined and humble Jamaican who has immigrated to Britain with his wife and children to secure a brighter future. Blighted with unexpected illness and racism, Norman and his family are resilient, but are all too aware that their family will need more than just hope to survive in their new country. At the turn of the millennium, Jesse seeks a fresh start in London, escaping a broken immediate family, a repressive religious community, and his depressed hometown in the industrial black country. Where did Jesse come from? We were talking about Norman Alonzo. Okay, all right. Jesse McCarthy is the is the main character. Is he Norman Alonzo's son? Let's move on and see. Uh, but once he arrives, he finds himself at a loss for a new center of gravity and turns to sex work, music, and art to create his own notions of love, masculinity, and spirituality. A wholly original novel, as tender as it is visceral, Rainbow Milk is a bold reckoning with race, class, sexuality, freedom, religion across generations, time, and culture. Uh, okay, and then we have the, the author bio on Paul Mendez. If it doesn't exactly mimic Jesse McCarthy, I am the czar of all the Russia. Uh, Paul Mendez is a London-based novelist, essayist, and screenwriter of Jamaican heritage. Born in 1982, uh, family immigrated in 1950s and raised Jehovah's Witness in the English West Midlands. Uh, Mendez disassociated himself from the Witnesses while still a teenager. In 2020, Dialogue Books published Rainbow Milk, which features the Observer's prestigious top 10 no debut novels list, and was shortlisted for the Gordon Byrne Prize. He has contributed to Esquire, The Face, Vogue, The Times Literary Supplement, London Review of Books, and The Brixton Review of Books, and is currently working towards an M.A., in black, liter in black British literature at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, okay, great. Well, uh, the uh, I should point out here that the Observer's, the Observer's top 10 best debut novels list may be prestigious, but it's not a patch on my own. <laughs> at the end of every year, who knows if this will be on my list in 2021, at the end of every year, I give you the best 10 debut novels in the American market. So, I wasn't, wasn't touching this thing when it was out in the UK, but now it's going to be out in America in June. Uh, no idea from the back uh, copy what the relationship is between Jesse McCarthy and Norman Alonzo. And, and if there is none, why are we hearing about Norman Alonzo? I'm assuming that Jesse is his son and that the, cover, the back cover copy just doesn't bother to make that clear. But we shall see. Uh, we shall see. Uh, so there we go. Uh, something for the gays. Uh, then we move on to this next package. A little floppy. Could be another. Uh, the other day we got uh, Paper Trails, an advanced copy, a very advanced copy of a new book about the formation of the United States in conjunction with the U.S. mail system. And I, a lot of you commented, a lot of you sent me emails wondering about that format because it was just pages that somebody had bound together in a copy shop. Uh, a lot of times when you get something floppy like this, that's what it is. It's a very advanced copy. Yeah. Yeah, this is, okay, this is another way to do it. The, the uh, Paper Trails had a spiral-bound thing. This is this, the same thing. It's just a, a, a different thing. So this is a very advanced copy. Is this also from Oxford University Press? No, this is from Pantheon Books. Uh, and this comes out in March. So this is Terror to the Wicked. America's first trial by jury that ended a war and helped to form a nation by Toby Pearl. That's the cover art book. Uh, let's see here. A brutal killing, an all-out manhunt, and a riveting account of the first murder trial in U.S. history set in the 1600s in colonial New England against the backdrop of the Pequot War between the Pequot tribes and the colonists of Massachusetts Bay. An explosive trial whose outcome changed the course of history ended a two-year war, and brought about a peace that allowed the colonies to become a full-blown nation. The year is 1638. The setting, Providence, Plymouth Colony. A young Nipmuc tribesman returning home from trading beaver pelts is fatally stabbed in a robbery in the woods near Plymouth Colony by a white runaway servant and fellow rogues. So he's set upon by a group. Fighting for his life, the, tra the tribesman is able to 
with his final breaths to reveal the details of the attack to Providence's governor, Roger Williams. A frantic manhunt for the fledgling gov by the fledgling government ensues, following, followed by the convening of the colony's first murder trial, with Plymouth Colony's governor, Thomas Prince, presiding as judge. The jury, local settlers, all white, whose allegiance seems more likely to be with the accused than with the murdered man who was a native. Piecing together a fascinating narrative through original research and first-rate detective work, Toby Pearl recreates in detail this startling, pivotal moment in pre-revolutionary America as she examines the evolution of our nascent civil liberties and the role of the jury as a safeguard against injustice. Toby Pearl earned degrees in law and international relations from Boston University and studied international law at the University of Hong Kong. She practiced law and taught at Emerson College. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this comes out in, uh, in March. Mm, and it sounds very good. It sounds very, very good. It also sounds like something I should send winging its way up to Vermont so that, uh, I mean, when, when we here in this little corner of Booktube hear the words pre-revolutionary New England, there's only one person we think of. <laughs> so maybe I should do that. Uh, this next one is one of these asbestos envelopes uh, where you have to open it very carefully and the tabs never work, so you really can't. You have to manhandle it open, and that allows clouds of flaking asbestos to uh, burst into the air and eventually get sucked into your lungs. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hazardous profession that I have. I will try to be very careful here. Very careful. Oh, my. Nice and gentle. Oh, oh, oh my. Okay. Uh, managed to get it out without too much trouble. Uh, this is a novel. Uh, by Simon Van Bui. Uh, this is Night Came with Many Stars. Faded sapia tone cover. And this comes out in uh, in June. Good Lord, another June thing. We're approaching the end of a month, which means I have to go through the now melancholy procedure of rearranging all of my uh, print galley copies. Melancholy because it used to be huge. It used to be a huge deal. I used to invite friends over to help me do it. And it was We were talking, you know, 100 books per month. Uh, printed copies per month and it was a whole bookcase that I had filled with them and they, it, it was a, a grand procession of moving everything up winnowing out the doubles putting everything in order by release week moving all the bottom months up I don't have anything like that anymore so it's it's a little bit sad <laughs> to, to rearrange these things but nevertheless absolutely have to do it I absolutely have to keep my print review copies in order I have to keep them organized I, I can't be fishing through them or and especially I can't lose track of something um, and here's hoping we can, I can hope that in the year 2021, those print review copies will increase, that the frequency will go back up. I don't think I'll ever get back to what it was, two mail tubs a day sometimes, and a whole bookcase, a whole big bookcase full of these kinds of books. I don't think it'll ever get back to that. But, uh, anyway, what have we got here? Night came with many stars. Uh, so I don't have, I don't have a pub sheet, but that's all right. We'll, uh. We'll go through this. Let's see here. Uh, do we have a, a description? Yes. Okay. In Kentucky, back in 1933, Carol's daddy lost his 13-year-old daughter in a game of cards. Award-winning author Simon Van Boy's spellbinding novel spans decades as he tells the story of Carol and the people in her life. I assume she's the daughter? Yeah, she's the daughter. Okay. Carol's daddy. Uh... Incidents intersect and lives unexpectedly change course in this masterfully interwoven story of chance and choice that leads home again to a night blessed with light. What you give in this world, an old man tells his grandson, will be given back to you. Manifestly untrue. <laughs> I mean, I have to deal with that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a novel, so it will, of course, have more resonance and more, more multiplicity than just the statement. But I have to deal with that kind of stuff, reviewing self-help books all the time. <laughs> it's a genre just built on on flat statements that are what Daniel Dennett refers to as deepities, <laughs> things that sound profound until you give them any kind of examination and you realize they're not profound. They're usually just flatly wrong, just, just flatly wrong. This one is what you give in this world will be given back to you. You all are adults. You've all been living in this world. Have you ever known that to be true? <laughs> Have you certainly known it to be the rule? Rather than the exception? No, of course you haven't. No, of course you haven't. I, I reviewed a book just the other day. 
one of those, you know, uh, crunchy granola business motivation books. The, and the author said with a completely straight face that arrogance and self-serving don't tend to work in the business community because they lead to your company's destruction. <laughs> this, is, this is a grown person. This author is in his 60s. And he made that claim in his book. Flies in the face of every single piece of lived, real-world experience that any of us has ever had. You go out into the work world, the business world, especially the corporate world, where this guy allegedly lived for years, all you're going to encounter is, is people who are so arrogant they could give God lessons. Their companies don't collapse. It's, that's not a, the kiss of death in the business world. Yet it's stated like a deepity. It's stated with complete profundity. And here, that, that's true in this case, too. What you give in this world will be given back to you. That is not true. <laughs> it's true. There are exceptions that sometimes happen, but usually not. Uh, but anyway, uh, in a novel, it's it's far more permissible because a, 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 a talented novelist can take something like that and do all sorts of things with it. Uh, and I'm going to assume I, that despite the fact that uh, a Simon Van Buy has is an award-winning author, I have never heard of him. I'm, have to, I'm going to assume that he's a talented author. I'll go into this book in late May. Uh, with a wide open mind and a wide open heart, wanting the author to lift me right up out of myself. We'll see. Uh, those words illuminate the actions within this unforgettable novel and its connected characters. A young man survives two nearly fatal accidents. A black family saves an orphaned white boy. A pregnant teenager is rescued by the side of the road. An autistic teenager is given his first job. Each incident grows in meaning and power over many decades as we see connections sometimes felt but not always apparent to the people themselves. Everything was moving, observes Carol's grandson in the Kentucky woods, an invisible force that was everywhere and made everything touch. Okay, so uh, contemporary fiction, uh, historical fiction, we'll see. I, it'd be a while until I read it, but uh, I'm all on board. Uh, then we've got this last one. So one of these pressed envelopes. It could be a mass market paperback. It could be a romance. Uh, we got here. What we have here is a violation of rule number one. And this comes close to being an I told you so moment. I have been waiting, a part of me, I've been very, very grateful to get all these presents in the mail. Good Lord, good Lord, the death of the Messiah in two volume box set. I've been very, very grateful to get all these presents in the mail, but I admit, a part of me has been waiting for one of you to slip up, for one of you to send me something that I don't want so that I can hammer home the point, don't send me a book. A part of me has been wondering if that was going to happen. And this sure comes close. I wish I could say I told you so, but no. No, I can't. This is a mass market paperback that I would actually want. And one of the reasons is that is it is exactly the kind of thing that I've got over my shoulder here that I like. It's just, there was a run by a, an editor and a product designer at Bantam Books about 40 years ago that just made a run of books that I really, really liked. I really liked the look of them. And this is one of them, even though it's by Ernest Hemingway. This is the Nick Adams stories. See, there's the, pantom col the Bantam Collar font, and this is kind of what they look like, where you've got this kind of type font, you've got original cover artwork, and you've got this is a signature thing where, where the, the back cover's text doesn't start until, you know, well below the halfway mark. So there's something about this design. Do I? Can I show you another one? Yeah. Uh, House of Seven Gables. Hang on, Hawthorne. House of Seven Gables. There you go. See what I mean? This is granted the the, the wording here fills more of the cover, but uh, this is this signet. No, this is Bantam. Yeah, where you've got it's a, a fairly minimal design with original cover artwork, uh, and I have had this copy of the Nick Adams stories uh, a few times. I don't at the moment, so this was a lucky guess, and luckier than most because I'm on record many times about not particularly liking Ernest Hemingway. So I don't get to read you the riot act with this one, but you came awful close. Awful close. Is it possible that one of you is so nice, is nice enough to have looked around and found some of these old bantams? And maybe sort of triangulated the, the period and the design that I'm talking about? Is that even possible? 
that one of you would get this design for me? I, I'm, I, there's no note with it. I'm incredibly grateful. I'm incredibly grateful. I will take that obnoxious sticker off there. That won't be hard to do. Uh, and I will also remove the adhesive underneath it. That also is not hard to do. <laughs> I've been doing these things, cleaning up books like this a million times. Uh, and then probably I will reinforce this and read some of it. So the day contained a gift. Rule number one has been flung down and danced upon yet again. And once again, I do not have a leg to stand on because I want this. I don't have it and I want it. I would like nothing better than I have a whole shelf of these particular, this particular kind of, of Bantam classics. See, that was the last one. It was like Homeward Angel. Uh, but there are, there are all sorts of others. Uh, this one I found in a little free library. The Idiot. Uh, I have a whole shelf of these things now, and I, I don't mind that at all. I don't have... I'm not going to tell you what I don't have. <laughs> thank you. Whoever you are, thank you. Uh, all right, so there you go. That is our mail haul for today. Uh, once again, a wide variety. So we have Terror to the Wicked, uh, a history of America's first murder trial uh, that I think I am going to put in a care package up to Vermont. Uh, then we have uh, Rainbow Milk. Those of you in the UK may already be familiar with this book. This is its American paper, our American uh, version. We have, uh, let's see here, Night Came with Many Stars. Interconnected short stories about uh, that that center in one way or another around one central character, one one central woman. Uh, then let's see here. Oh, something fell anyway. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. I'm gonna have to figure this out. That's all. And I'm I'm gonna have to figure it out right away because I can't take these spikes of irritation. I, I don't want I don't want them in my life. So. I'm going to have to figure this out right away. I am obviously not going to move in five pieces of furniture for, to this room for every video. And I'm not going to keep five pieces of furniture in this room. I like the open floor. So I'm going to have to figure out a radically different way to film videos. Just radically different. Someplace, probably on the floor, so that I have five square miles of storage space. Because I can't take things falling to the floor every single time I make a video. So I will deal with that on my own. So we have, uh, the next one we have is A Vineyard of Painted Moon, uh, a Susan Mallory romance. Uh, let me deal with the disaster here, everything that fell. Where did it all go? I have to bend down off camera uh, for the 10th time in a row. Uh, then we have No Holding Back by Laurie Foster. Saucy romance, not at all like Susan Mallory. Uh, and finally, The Nick Adams Stories uh, by Ernest Hemingway as a gift from one of you. So, uh, not a bad mail haul <laughs> as things go. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for the present. Very grateful. <laughs> Just don't do it again. <laughs> so I will, I will wrap this up for now, but I will be back. Thank you, book two.